Hi, everybody. Um, as Georgette said, my name is Sue Butler, and um, I am now happily retired, but mental health um, will always be my passion. I had um, serious mental health issues within my family, so I come to it genetically, I think. Um, I'm going to just talk for a very few minutes because I really want to give Rob Edwards, who's the executive director of the Lee Carlson Center for Mental Health and Well-Being, and Scott Nadu, who is the chief of police for Columbia Heights, to have um, the most amount of time this evening to share with you some aspects of mental health. Mental health is really a huge topic, and it almost sort of feels like whatever part of the elephant you're holding is the part that is, for you, the only part. But it, it's huge, and it encompasses a lot of different aspects. So tonight, you, I gave you a handout. I hope most of you were able to get this. If you don't, would you let have your emails, make sure we get your emails, and I will send you these, this information. I'm sorry I didn't, if I didn't bring enough. I, I brought 35. So the first one is the League of Women Voters adopted a Colorado's position paper on what they term behavioral health. And I'm not going to review those with you because I want these guys to have the most time tonight. But if you have questions with, uh, on any of that, um, you can get my email and I will be happy to answer any questions by email. Um, and, and they came up with a list of um, behavioral health recommendations. I also wanted you to be aware that last year the, governor's, the governor had a task force on mental health. And that task force came out with nine recommendations. Serendipitously, I think there's a great alignment between the governor's task force recommendations and the league platform recommendations. So that, that is really good news. Um, and that, the, the recommendations from the governor's um, task force are on this single, it's a back-to-back -back page. So um, I also, in preparation for this, went to talk with Sue Abderholden. Sue Abderholden is the executive director of the National Alliance for Mental Health or Mental Illness in Minnesota. And um, she did want to let me know that, that NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, does not really support the, the term behavioral health. They feel that behaviors are perceived as being elected. In other words, I choose this behavior. And, um, the, and so that she felt that because mental illness drives behaviors. And she, she just wanted me to mention that. So I want you to know that. The National Alliance on Mental Illness offers um, supports and resources beyond what you could even imagine. Um, Understanding Psychosis is one of the booklets that they have at no cost to people. Um, keeping Families Together and Hope for Recovery. And that's one of the reasons why I am so passionate about mental, mental health is that there is always good news. There, there, people with early intervention and treatment can improve and lead really normal lives. And um, it is just critical that we maintain that. And before I turn it over, I want you to understand that the proposed legislation at the federal level does not require mental health. It's, it's kind of a, of a they're, they're saying you pick what you want. So the parity of insured around mental health services will no longer be in existence. And that could dramatically hurt the program that Rob is going to talk to you about. So um, I think, Rob, you're up first. So I'm going to introduce Rob Edwards. Um, worked with him happily for a little over a year. And um, you can take it away, Rob. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. And congratulations on your platform. Um, I think it's a good one. Um, I also don't talk too much about behavioral health myself. I tend to talk about mental wellness, uh, mental well-being, sometimes mental health. Uh, and that's because uh, of, of uh, trauma that we have in, in our communities that really impact our mental wellness. Uh, that's more of a story of, of you know, what, uh, not what's wrong with me, uh, but what's happened to me. 
So not all mental illnesses are uh, rooted in trauma, but a lot are, and uh, we tend to kind of focus on it. Oh, can't hear me here. Let's test the microphone first. How's that? Oh, look at that. So yeah, thank you for, for that introduction, Sue. Um, my name's Rob Edwards. I'm the executive director at Lee Carlson Center. And uh, our logo, we have to change that up. It's been about 37 years now uh, that we've been, <laughs> that we've been uh, operating in the, the greater Anoka County community. So we've been serving uh, residents of this community here um, through our clinic uh, based in Fridley, but also um, other services that uh, get out of the clinic into your schools um, and into the community. Our mission at, at Lee Carlson Center is to provide exceptional and affordable mental health services for family, children, youth, and adults in our community. And that mission is, is one that uh, we adopted about eight, uh, nine years ago uh, when Central Center for Family Resources became Lee Carlson Center for Mental Health and Wellbeing. Um, our, that was about the time that uh, our, our founder passed away about 10 years ago. And the agency really wanted to uh, take a strategic approach forward, uh, develop an, an, a revised mission statement, and rename the organization in Lee Carlson's honor. <clears throat> also just want to mention a couple other affiliations I have. I'm the vice chair of the National Association of Social Workers Minnesota chapter. Um, and uh, I'm very involved with them um, on a couple different uh, levels. We recently, last uh, two Fridays ago, we did, we have a national initiative uh, this year called Stand Up, Social Workers Stand Up, and we put together a full day training. Uh, I spoke around Stand Up, moving practice systems, leadership and supervision, and integrating a social work vision in organizational leadership and supervision. Um, and we, we often host these um, Sometimes they, they are about politics, sometimes they are about uh, just the social work profession, ethics, um, supervision, and uh, the field of study. Uh, a lot of training around uh, clinical social work available through our association. And our website, neSW.org, is a place where you can find more information. Also, I serve as the chairperson on the communications committee there. I'm also the board member of our association, uh, our organization belongs to, called Aspire MN. If you're familiar with the Capitol or um, with uh, Children's Services, we just renamed our association after 50 years. Prior to that, we were called the Minnesota Council of Child Caring Agencies, MCCCA. So we recently rebranded uh, after 50 years, um, and we're focused around an association of resources and advocacy for children, youth, and families. And currently I'm serving uh, on the board and also as the chairperson of our Emerging Practices Committee. We're really excited about trying to find and be on the front of the wave of that next service intervention that will benefit children, youth, and families. So one of the focuses of, of our agency, our primary focus really, um, is, is one of prevention. And we try to focus every one of our programs on early diagnosis and treatment. So if you think about uh, little children who are uh, just entering uh, early learning center, um, preschool age, and uh, maybe a parent who has, this is their first child um, entering school age, and we start to, start to pick up on uh, some needs that children might have even at that early age. Um, that's an, a place right where uh, Lee Carlson Center becomes involved. We're actually embedded in the Early Learning Center with uh, therapy staff right at the Centennial School District Early Learning Center in uh, Lionel Lakes. And uh, right there we've got a place where we could be in a school that Early Learning Center is actually housed with an elementary school in the same building. So we're really working with kids as young as three, as young as four. Um, and then uh, those children, if they're needing services in the Early Learning Center, they're you know, walking right into elementary school in the same building, and we can continue the continuity of care. We also look at uh, early diagnosis and treatment um, for first-time offenders of domestic abuse. So we run a, a very uh, long-standing 20-week uh, evidence-based uh, 
program for men who are offenders and women who are offenders, uh, men's and women's groups. And, what, and our group is unique uh, in the fact that we have a number of groups that run throughout uh, the morning each week and through the evenings. Um, we don't have any waiting lists at all. And that's really a, <clears throat> a novel approach to serving that population. Pretty much anywhere else you go, um, you have to wait on a waiting list for three, four, five, six weeks before you can be seen. Um, and you've probably been court ordered uh, to those services. Um, and we work hard with, with guys over a, and, and women over a 20 week period. Um, and there's a big turning point that happens somewhere between eight and 12 weeks in. Um, and the, the neat part that we have uh, going on with our group right now, um, the groups that we offer, uh, there's no waiting list, so it's, it's uh, men come into the group, women come into the group, and then next week another person is added, another person is added week four. Um, the groups are about 10 men on average, 10 women, and uh, the folks who have been in the group 10, 15 weeks uh, really play a role, not that they're asked to, but they naturally play a role in mentoring the people who are coming into the group for the first time. And it's an it's amazing transformation and uh, it's something we didn't really plan on to have that mentorship component and we're starting to take a look at more and, and uh, try to understand um, that the neat value that there is uh, that we didn't intend to have there and, and see how we can further explore that. Uh, but again, there is another place where we're doing as much as we can on the front end of the process. Um, for most of the men and women that we see in that program, they, they are uh, referred for the first time to this program. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's what they've gotten instead of a jail sentence for domestic abuse. And uh, you know, they stay in the group for 20 weeks, um, and they're, they're given a certificate at the end. Um, so we're, we're really working and focusing on prevention. Um, we do that with young ch children, but also with children of all ages in school settings. We work with, uh, and I'm going to move on here just to, to get to, I'm going to talk about schools in a second. Um, I'd also just want to talk, I talked very briefly, you couldn't hear me on the microphone very well, about trauma. But this is another piece that we see in addition to prevention. We see uh, the effects of, of sustained trauma over time. Um, and, and so this is a, a situation where we haven't necessarily been able to be involved early enough. And now trauma has been a factor and it's affecting the life of an individual who seeks our support. And just to tell you how, how uh, terrible of a thing trauma can be in the life of an individual, individuals who experience trauma, and there's a definition of what that is, are 15 times more likely to commit suicide, four times more likely to uh, be an, become an alcoholic, um, three times more likely to be absent from work, and three times more likely to experience depression, uh, 2.5 times more likely to smoke tobacco. So there's many things that, um, you know, as a, as a mental health agency, we're focused on working on the front end as much as possible, prevention, but we also work on the deep end. We work with uh, children and families who have been caught in a cycle um, that really uh, creates a challenge uh, to move forward, to get ahead. Um, the root of that is uh, trauma, and it, it could be cyclical as well. Um, so we're really working twofold on in in and through the lifespan uh, with children, um, adolescents, adults, uh, and with families. So a little bit more about who we serve. Uh, we serve about four thousand clients every year, um, and if you count uh, the mother who comes in with a young child, who we did not capture her health insurance, but we captured the health insurance of the individual consumer, the one we're serving, the child. If you count the mother or other family members or the siblings who aren't necessarily our client in therapy, but are part of that treatment plan that we wrap around a child, uh, we can pretty easily say that we're serving six to 7,000 individuals through the impact of our interventions. So we're doing that work uh, with, again, I mentioned this com this community, so Anoka County and some northern suburbs. But um, if, 
people still uh, in northern suburbs we don't have a whole lot of uh, facilities outside of the county folks are driving in for services like our domestic abuse program because they can get in here they can't get in in uh, Ramsey County or a Hennepin County program for example um, also 70 percent of our consumers are uninsured or insured under a Medicaid plan uh, lower rates of reimbursement essentially uh, is what we encounter in individuals with low to moderate incomes so 70 percent is is very very high uh, in terms of this population of uninsured and insured under Medicaid plans uh, these are state sponsored health insurance plans subsidized uh, by the state um, and income uh, qualifies you for those coverages uh, 70 percent um, again is a is a very large number many many clinics you'll find uh, 30 uh, maybe 40 percent so it really is a mission of ours to serve that population we also serve all ages like I mentioned three to four year olds in that early learning center uh, situation as well as at the clinic in play therapy rooms through the lifespan uh, we have a drop-in center where we serve uh, many people approaching their 80s or in their 80s A little bit more about the clinic so when we talk about clinic services and we talk about mental health the primary service we provide is psychotherapy and we'll do that individually one-on-one -on -one with individuals we also do that uh, in families uh, family therapy uh, we'll also do that with couples and then also a, a lot of specialized group programming so we do group psychotherapy services as well we also provide psychiatry services so that's uh, medication evaluation and then also uh, medication management and that's highly subsidized we actually pay our our psychiatrists more than we are reimbursed um, and that's one of the the bills I'm going to talk about tonight uh, that we have at the legislature this session um, but psychiatry we do that service for children adolescents and adults now just as of last week we also provide testing and assessment um, psychological testing uh, some of the same testing they provide in the school setting but also some that uh, goes beyond what uh, is provided in the school setting we can do that with all ages and that helps us verify uh, and validate a diagnosis that someone would receive we do a lot of collaboration between healthcare providers to make sure we get it right when it comes to mental health and a diagnosis I also mentioned the domestic abuse program um, and that can be referred by the court or even uh, self-referral or even a, a health care provider can refer someone for those services and in that domestic abuse program we have a very uh, innovative uh, program that we add on if you're a parent and that is restorative parenting services so you can rebuild the bonds of parenting uh, with your children uh, thinking that those have been disrupted in most situations we also work with uh, not just the abuser but the victim we have a lot of uh, victim supports as well you can see victims individually but also in a group settings so they can uh, come around common issues together um, as women or as men and then our specialties including dialectical behavioral therapy play therapy uh, real uh, quickly developing trauma program and then we support adoption both prior to adoption and post adopt we're actually a referral site for uh, the state min adopt program uh, if there's someone in the community that contacts min adopt they'll refer them to our clinic and then in our schools um, we're up to 20 schools now uh, and that that is k-12 early learning centers and alternative learning centers so we are serving um, children up to the age of 21 in alternative learning centers um, across three school districts and that's essentially the same psychotherapy service that we provide in clinic we just create uh, 20 satellite clinics inside schools the school partners with us uh, they don't uh, pay for the service what they do is give us an office and a phone uh, and they are a great collaborative partner and our referrals uh, come from the school staff they come from the parents in the school uh, from the teachers from the principal um, and that that uh, partnership has just really blossomed and expanded I'm going to talk a little bit about some legislation that we're looking at uh, this session about that uh, program schooling mental health so about 800 uh, outpatient clients in the schools are served every year across three districts so 800 kids get our services 
a year. We also have a, a mental health rehab uh, classroom where we ha uh, two different classrooms where we have a therapist in the classroom with the teacher all day every day, and that program serves 65 individuals a year. And then we do offer a, a service, a support that isn't therapy, but it's peer support. So we gather kids together around a common challenge. Parents who have gotten divorced. Last year we had a group uh, of children who had uh, experienced gun violence in some way in their family, and they came together in a support group. Uh, those children don't carry a diagnosis. They're not delivered therapy, but uh, that's a support group for those children. And then our other program, just to talk about really quickly, is Bridgeview. And that's a drop-in center f um, for adults with severe persistent mental illness. That's that acronym SPMI uh, in Anoka County. So Anoka County, anywhere you are, we will come with our van and pick you up. We have a driver that works full-time. Um, I was able to substitute for him when he was in Hawaii the other week, so that was really exciting to be out on the road driving and picking people up and seeing what that's like. Transportation we've in Anoka County can be challenging, and you know, if you can imagine an individual with disabilities, um, and a lot of our SPMI population struggles uh, with low, lower income. A lot of folks don't drive, so they do depend on uh, transportation. So we provide it through our service uh, at Bridgeview. We're open six hours a day. Folks can drop in to socialize. We can pick them up. They can drive themselves. They can uh, be provided therapy and support groups uh, right there on site. Uh, we do uh, host field trips out into the community. Uh, we have a beautiful art room that we've put together where we do art therapy. Where we have open art time as well. We host volunteers in there uh, quite often. And we also have a writer's workshop. Uh, we do holiday parties and bingo. Um, every day at noon we have a, f a free lunch for everyone. Um, and it's a very healthy lunch. Uh, we've worked with uh, nutritionists to help us make sure that's the healthiest lunch we can provide. Uh, sometimes there's leftovers and folks take those away with them. We also have health and wellness programs. We had a woman who worked with us last year and uh, she was with us for six months. She was on high blood pressure medication. Um, you know, she was ch her life was changing a lot as she was uh, with us um, every every day or every week, and she was able to, to to go off her high blood pressure medication after six months of visiting Bridgeview. It was a major major success. So our website looks like this. If you have a chance to look us up and look at all the resources and information there, if, you, if someone you know that you want to make uh, refer to us, uh, all the information about how to contact us is there. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the legislation this session that's really impacting mental health, but also our agency uh, directly. Um, our association, like I mentioned, I'm on the board of directors there, is called Aspire in Minnesota. And we're all about resources and advocacy for children, youth, and families. So we have uh, a few bills this year. I'm just going to double check here. I put most of them on this page. I'm going to talk about two bills specifically. And I think I gave Sue some handouts of this document, so you can take those with you. So you don't have to write all this down. You can just... Uh, I don't know that there are enough handouts for everybody. We did hand them out, but okay. I didn't have enough either, so... Sure. We'll talk first about this uh, Senate, Senate file 927, House file 1176. We had the committee uh, meeting for the House bill. And I gave testimony that was last week. Uh, that was ha uh, Hamilton's bill, uh, Ron Hamilton. And um, that bill was about a rate increase for mental health services and to set the published medical assistance rate as the base rate for all managed care plans that contract with the state. So let me just break this down and talk a little bit about uh, what this means. We have had a relatively flat rate of reimbursement for psychotherapy services, for master's level clinicians that work in outpatient mental health clinics like our agency, relatively flat for about five, six, seven years. Um, you know, it's gone up, but then it's also gone down. And that doesn't really keep up with uh, the challenges of, you know, cost of living, uh, you know, the increases that we see in other ways in terms of expenses and costs. And as a nonprofit, 
uh, obviously every dollar counts. And that medical assistance rate, and the managed care rate, that's those 70% uh, of the clients we serve, uh, those tend to be the lower reimbursement rates. So it's really important that those rates continue to rise incrementally each year, 2%, 3%, 4%. If we get 5%. So this bill is about increasing those rates by 10% to catch up for lost time. It's also about uh, also increasing the psychiatry rates of reimbursement by 20%. And I wanted to mention that because I mentioned earlier that we subsidize psychiatry. We don't have to provide psychiatry in the community. Um, it co it's costly. Providers are hard to find and, and they're worth uh, a lot uh, to, to pay what you need to pay to bring those folks in to provide that service. We have three very part-time psychiatrists working across uh, all ages, and we subsidize that probably about 30 to 40 percent um, of what it costs to provide that service over what we're reimbursed. So this rate would increase, uh, this bill would increase psychiatry reimbursement by 20%. So again, this is just about just kind of clawing up to the baseline and get back to where we need to be just to be viable or close to viable in providing services uh, reimbursed under these, help, under these health plans. The other piece about this is um, you've heard of UCARE, you've heard of Medica, you've heard of Health Partners, Blue Cross Blue Shield, all of those health plans, they contract with the state of Minnesota to take their medical assistance recipients and provide coverage to them. Um, what had been happening, and it affected our clinic uh, last year significantly, is uh, they would contract, the state would contract with the health plan, and the health plan could negotiate rates with providers at whatever level. They don't even have to pay the medical assistance level. Uh, many do. Uh, many pay more than the medical assistance level. And... Um, but they don't have to. So this, this law would actually require health plans that contract uh, as a private company, contract with the state of Minnesota to provide coverage to their, to their insured, uh, require them to pay at least the medical assistance rate of reimbursement to providers, at least as a floor. And so you can provide uh, a larger rate of reimbursement. So um, this is something that's a, an important safeguard because if a health plan comes in and contracts with the state, the state thinks they're getting a good deal. It's a rural county where there's only one provider, and then this new provider shows up on the scene January 1st. They're in because they're the low bid. They have no contracts with any of the providers in your community. You could be trying to get a contract as a provider with those health plans for months and months and months, and they can pay what they want to pay, which could be a cutback on the rate. So that happened to us last year. And our association actually authored, uh, put this bill together with uh, the House uh, Representative Hamilton um, to really advocate on behalf of uh, our provider agencies. I just want to say, in this kind of situation, where this, the experience that Lee Carlson had last year with this reduced payment, had that not been corrected, it was, it was possible that the agency could have gone out of business. So... You have to pay people, and if you don't get reimbursed at least at, at the rate that you're paying them, it, it jeopardized the ability of, our, of the agency to um, exist. So, so it's an important safeguard even if it doesn't happen. And it happened to other uh, agencies across the state uh, where they were suddenly reimbursed for a major percentage of their clientele uh, at 50% of what they had been just the month previous. And it really takes many, many months. Uh, it took me about 10 months to negotiate uh, what we needed and get a retro payment. So it can affect uh, the business. And so we want to put regulation in place as a protection of our infrastructure of mental health service providers. I'll also just quickly mention one other bill here, and this is uh, down the screen here, Senate File 1369, House File 960. Klein and Backer, the SchoolLink Mental Health Bill. In SchoolLink Mental Health, I mentioned we, we are doing services in schools, three districts, 20 schools, about 800 uh, students receive our services uh, through all age groups in all school settings. And just uh, 
you know, just to mention, it's a very successful program. A lot of children uh, are getting services that wouldn't otherwise. Uh, a lot of children are getting services from uh, minority uh, groups, and they're able to access services in the school setting uh, without uh, coming home, waiting for mom and dad to get home from work in two parent families where, or one parent families where the parent works and it's 7.30 at night, and can you imagine then going out to see a therapist? Um, so we're putting services uh, accessibly right inside the school setting, um, and it, it, it's actually uh, the health insurance plan of the recipient receiving the service pays for it. And what the state does and the state dollars is and what we're trying to increase here is to be able to offer this program not just to a third of the districts in the, in the state, but to every district in the state. And some, uh, the, there's a supplemental for individuals who aren't insured that the state uh, grants pay for. So if you're uninsured um, or if you have a high deductible health plan, you can request support. And our state funds that we've been granted by the state can help underwrite the cost of that. We also do a lot of coordination with the school. And believe it or not, the health insurance plan doesn't court, doesn't uh, pay for that type of time spent coordinating services with school professionals, but we really need to do it, and uh, we get paid a small uh, percentage of our regular reimbursement rate per hour out of the grant, out of the state funds. So our idea is to hopefully grow this program. Um, last year, uh, we tried to do that, um, and uh, I think we were looking at $1.45 million additional funding to this program. We're hoping uh, to, to be there again this year. Um, a lot of the conversations from both, both, both sides of the aisle is about making sure that this, these successful programs are available to every community across Minnesota, um, and that's something that most people can vote for. But it's, it's also a cost-sharing approach, so uh, the state doesn't fund the entire cost. Um, agencies step forward who can do this uh, very, in, very affordably. And um, the, the uh, health insurance also pays for those services. I'll just uh, mention real quick, uh, one of the things that we try to do at the agency, we uh, hosted a public policy institute this last year just to make sure that um, all of our therapists had an opportunity to hear about all the bills that are going on in the mental health world. Uh, they were impacted uh, by policy last year. Um, we just wanted to make sure that they understood that. Uh, there were places that they could uh, connect and advocate. Um, we had an opportunity to bring our associate director out from the association to talk about all our bills. We watched a webinar. We're also Minnesota Council of Nonprofits members, and we were able to download a webinar and watch it with our staff about how a bill becomes a law. Um, so folks could learn about that. And then we also had a Q&A and storytelling with uh, Representative Connie Bernardi. She came in, uh, heard some of the stories that staff were able to tell client success stories and, you know, Q&A with her about working at the Capitol, what it's like uh, to move on these bills. Uh, so it was a really successful day, something we did just organizationally. Um, I threw this in here. We don't have much time to talk about that, but there's some great uh, resources uh, available online. This is from the Wilder Foundation about how a bill becomes a law. So we're able to walk through this with our staff a little bit, and uh, I was... Uh, testifying last week about that bill uh, way up on the top at the beginning of the funnel, so it's got a long ways to go still. So we just talked about uh, that bill, the, the rates bill and the school-linked bill. Um, so the, the school-linked bill, one thing, one thing more about that is that uh, overall students of color were served Significantly more, uh, they were significantly more likely to be, be accessing mental health services for the first time compared to white students. Um, I mean, that was, that was a major victory. It's something we didn't expect to see, but um, was really an outcome that uh, we can say was very successful. Um, and the increase, 47.5% um, of children met criteria for a severe uh, emotional disturbance. So... That means that 47.5% uh, half of the children that we served in this program were probably not getting their needs met, but they had significant mental health challenges, half of the kids. 
So without the program, not only would you have many kids, you know, ac- not be able to access the service, but you would have uh, many kids who are really at risk. This is just a picture of where schooling mental health is happening um, in our state. And that each number on this map is an agency doing services. And so most counties have the service, but not all, uh, not all school districts. We've done a good job over the last five years, and these grants from the state are five years. We've got another year left on this five-year cycle. And then with the next five-year cycle, our, our goal really is to make sure that more school districts, um, you know, significantly, maybe we could double the number of school districts, if not the ambitious goal of uh, being in every school district or at least a mental health therapist. I mentioned that I am on the vice chair of the National Association of Social Workers, so we do have a day on the Hill. I just want to mention this. Uh, if you're a social worker, if you know social workers, you're certainly invited to come up to the Hill this day, uh, April 3rd. Uh, we actually are going to have a rally at the Armory. Last year we had 900 social workers. Um, a lot of social work students come, uh, a lot of other professionals. And we march to the Capitol. There will be a rally in the Rotunda, um, and we'll have a few... Uh, Legislators um, speaking at the at the rotunda on that day. I think it's a Thursday, April third, NASW Day on the Hill. And here are the legislative priorities also for our social work association. NASW opposes anything that creates less affordable and sub- substandard insurance or health care. Uh, just like uh, Sue had mentioned uh, prior to introducing me here. NASW opposes any legislation that reduces voting access. This includes provisional ballot, voter ID, or anything that challenges citizens' right to vote. Uh, NASW supports families and an increase in Minnesota Family Investment Programs, MFIP. NASW opposes any government intervention relating to women's rights. And NASW supports increase in funds for vo- affordable housing and or homelessness prevention or relief. So that's uh, my presentation, a little bit about some of the, the bills, a couple of real important bills for our agency for mental health uh, right now, going through the process, under deadlines. Um, we'll see you know, how we can move those things forward. I've given you some of the information so you can advocate uh, on behalf of mental health. Um, and just want to thank you for your time, and it's been great just to uh, tell you a little bit about our story as an agency and uh, right here f- uh, from your community. Any questions? They're going to submit <coughs> cards for questions, so we'll have Scott start, and then we'll collect cards. Very good. I'm a card Thank collector. You. And um, Scott is the chief of police for Columbia Heights, and um, one of the reasons I invited Scott to talk this evening is that I think <coughs> a lot of us have had or heard headlines where individuals with mental illness have been injured or murdered during, uh, or shot, killed, during uh, inter- interactions with the police. And one of the things that Scott has been very active in doing is seeking training so that um, he and his um, police force can interact with people who don't have predictable behavioral patterns. And that's a, an issue with mental illness. So if you don't have predictable behavioral patterns, it puts everyone at risk, and, and yet you don't want to do something that would have a negative outcome for, for a person who's really not in charge at the moment. So, Scott, do you want to talk? Thank you. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Sue uh, was kind enough to invite me, but she didn't tell me that it was going to be such a delicious meal of soup and salad when I got here. So <laughs> that was a welcome treat. I'm trying to pay you off any way I can. <laughs> So here's some of the things we're going to talk about today. Just a little bit about Columbia Heights because it's a unique community here in Anoka County. Um, Some questions about why are police so concerned about helping people uh, in crisis or who have uh, uh, mental illness or persistent mental illness. Um, And um, I also thought I'd touch just a little bit on some of the efforts that uh, came out of the President's 21st Century Task Force Policing Report about mental wellness and policing uh, for our officers. So just as a little bit of background, uh, Columbia Heights is 
the southernmost county uh, in Anoka, or city in Anoka County. Uh, we're a fantastic community of about 20,000 residents. For those that have not been to Columbia Heights for uh, the last 10 or 15 years, I know that I talked to one of the members in attendance who said that she was from Columbia Heights but had moved to northern Anoka County. Uh, right now, Columbia Heights is, is still kind of in a transition where we're really continuing to change demographically. It's become, in many ways, I think, an extension of northeast Minneapolis where it's very multicultural. Um, there's a lot of uh, great ethnic restaurants. Uh, you look at our schools and um, you'll really see that diversity. Right now, we're about 75 percent uh, non-white or Caucasian in our schools. So we've got uh, any mix of African-American, uh, people from Asian cultures that are there. Uh, we have a significant number of uh, Latinos and uh, Hispanic kids. And we've got a, a number of Somalis, too. And for us as a police department, uh, it's really been uh, an amazing uh, ride for us to, to be able to learn more about these cultures, to diversify our workforce. For an example, we now have uh, three African officers. One is Ethiopian, two are Somali. So uh, getting to learn more about different cultures, different religions. And I'm very proud to say that in uh, 2016, Columbia Heights, because of the way that we're known to work with all of our cultures and because of the way that we work collaboratively, particularly in ways that benefit youth, we were one of 10 cities in America that was selected to be an all-American city last year. So yeah, we're very proud of that. Very proud of that. Just as an example, uh, the way that we work around our kids, um, our police department leads a mentoring uh, initiative through the Big Brothers Big Sisters of uh, the Greater Twin Cities, and the majority of our officers mentor a young person in one of our elementary schools. And so we've got some great uh, things that we're doing in Columbia Heights, but we are here to talk about policing and uh, working with uh, different populations, particularly the mentally ill. So one of the things that I think some people might ask is, how is policing uh, consistent with helping people and, and, uh, and why all of this emphasis on trying to, to train your officers to better work with people that have uh, mental illness? And I think that it's real consistent with their mission statement, which you see up on top there. And I won't read it for you uh, line by line, but there's a couple of parts in here uh, in the mission statement that I think really reinforce why we do these things. First of all, it says something about active partnerships. So we believe that we are not there to police the community necessarily by ourselves. We're there to work with our community to promote safety by working with the community, right? Secondly, you'll see a part in there about innovatively solving problems. So when we encounter people that need our assistance that might be in crisis or who might, um, uh, as Rob has talked about, have been, uh, you know, the victim of trauma, you know, instead of just arresting people, I think there's been a whole reawakening in the last 20 years in law enforcement. And you're starting to hear more sheriffs talking about why do we have so many of the mentally ill in our jails. So before the mentally ill can even get to jail, we want to make sure that our officers are well-trained and well-positioned to be out doing great things in our community, working with people to solve problems in ways that doesn't necessarily uh, bring people into the criminal justice system that would be better served uh, by working with counselors or working with uh, other uh, maybe medical professionals at any given time. And those things obviously, to get to the last part of it, help us as a police department and as a community to enhance safety and the quality of life in our cities. Let's skip through a little bit of this. Um, so when you look at law enforcement versus community policing, law enforcement I think is what we're all used to uh, from seeing, uh, you know, maybe cops on TV, right? Um, I think our police department is very different. We're very uh, community oriented. And when you look at the statistics and how we can be impactful in law enforcement, you know that millions of people suffer from mental illness in varying degrees. Uh, one of the things that we found of the people that we know uh, nationally, but also locally, is that about 38% of police use of force is estimated to involve those with mental illness. Now, again, you know, sometimes you'll say it's mental illness. Uh, about the same percentage, or maybe even a little bit more, are people that are intoxicated, uh, either on alcohol or drugs or otherwise. And so sometimes, you know, the people that we know to be uh, intoxicated or under the influence of drugs may also be 
masking some sort of a mental illness issue, right? And it's kind of a chicken and an egg argument then. Did the, uh, did the mental illness uh, get them to want to be intoxicated or was it maybe the other way around? Um, we talked a little bit about our, our job to try and serve people better and um, try to uh, work with them in ways that um, are more helpful. And towards the end of the slide, I'm going to show you the arrest rates and how this type of training has helped us, particularly with youth, in making sure that we're, again, helping uh, our society's youth and not just sending them to court or otherwise incarcerating them. So CIT training uh, is something that is not new. It was pioneered in 1988 <clears throat> when uh, a person in the Memphis area uh, was, uh, I believe, schizophrenic, having hallucinations, and they were shot by a police officer. In Minnesota, we've got our own local uh, example. There's actually a foundation called the Barbara Schneider Foundation. Barbara Schneider was a woman in Minneapolis about 15 years ago who, um, again, was having a, a kind of a, a psychiatric break or was in crisis, and she was shot and killed after she got a knife uh, in the presence of some Minneapolis police officers. And so in Minnesota, uh, we've tried to work on crisis intervention training over the course of the last probably 15 years. I was probably one of the first non-Minneapolis officers to go through the program, and I would have gone through about 15 years ago. Uh, since then, uh, it's really, I think, caught on in the last probably five years because of all of the national attention, all of the public uh, attention, public pressure on law enforcement agencies to uh, make sure that their staff is sufficiently trained, that they're not using more force in any given situation than the uh, case would absolutely call for. So in Columbia Heights, uh, we organized a countywide training effort we wanted to make sure that every officer uh, in Anoka County was trained, and we did that uh, in 2011 with a two-day training in Columbia Heights uh, right now. Uh, the gold standard for crisis intervention training, uh, which involves working with trained actors. So there's the theory part, but then they bring in specially trained actors that come in and uh, demonstrate uh, a number of different behaviors where um, our officers then have to try and de-escalate those, those uh, folks. And um, the gold standard is a five-day training. And so by the end of this year, uh, every Columbia Heights police officer will have been through the entire five-day training. In many agencies, they uh, train a certain number of people. But the problem is that you can't always count on the people that are receiving that particular training are going to be working and at that scene exactly when you need them. So this is a big investment on the part of Columbia Heights, the citizens of Columbia Heights. This will cost uh, a lot of uh, money and training dollars, but we absolutely think it's great training. And it gives the officer on the street a lot of tools in their toolbox for how they can de-escalate some of those behaviors. And once the situation has kind of calmed down, uh, CIT, again, gives you some tools so that you know um, maybe to contact um, you know, their medical professional or you've got access to people that work in the county systems uh, or if the person's on probation or parole that you're doing those follow-ups so that you know, you're not trying to put a band-aid on a problem, calm a situation, and then leave uh, knowing that that situation could then kind of flare up again days or weeks later. But you might be working with uh, uh, folks in an educational setting. Uh, you might be working with a uh, county. You might be working with the court system uh, just to make sure that the folks have the training uh, that they can be the most impactful with the people that they are working with. So just as a, um, a couple of examples, um, uh, you know, you could have, um, and we did, uh, after we started giving this training to our officers years ago, uh, a person uh, with dementia that's shoplifting items from a dollar store, right? Now, if that person puts the items in their pockets and they walk out the door, a more traditional response may have been uh, to issue that person a, a citation for shoplifting. But I think that, you know, as a community, you know, it's tough for us to be able to get our hands around that because what the person really needs is to be um, brought back to their care center or their family and, and making sure that the appropriate follow-ups are taking place so that um, they um, can get the help that they need. Another thing that we see uh, a lot of times, uh, a great example would be runaway youth. So when our officers go to a, a home and there's a child that's run away, particularly if they've seen that this child has run away before, uh, our officers are trained 
to, uh, to do a better assessment of why is this child running away from home? Is there some sort of a, uh, an abuse issue, uh, whether that be neglect or sexual abuse, uh, emotional abuse, <coughs> physical abuse? Is there um, uh, some sort of a trauma? Is there an untreated um, mental health issue? Uh, they're really just trained to kind of dig down a little bit deeper. So um, in CIT, it's all about partnership. So uh, some of our partners, as we work with people in crisis, might be the Barbara Schneider Foundation uh, and the Minnesota Criti uh, Critical Intervention Training Officers Association. So they're primarily people that we work with to train. Uh, but as we work with people uh, who might be in crisis or have mental illness, uh, you've got a whole listing of people that um, our officers have access to uh, to make sure that they um, can effectively problem solve with kids and uh, adults as well to make sure that they get the help that they need. In some instances, um, particularly in um, cases where we've got uh, people that really uh, have struggled and need that extra help, we've actually had officers that have gone to um, court and been able to testify about some of the issues that they've seen in an effort to make sure that these folks are getting the help that they need. Rob touched just a little bit on uh, trauma. So this was uh, Dr. Isaiah Pickens. He came out uh, from uh, California last year to work with our staff so that officers could understand the effects of trauma uh, and how that affects the people that we're dealing with. Um, a lot of times you might have had people that had very negative uh, contacts with police, either in Minnesota, uh, the United States, or in their country of origin. So if you came from Mexico, for example, you might have seen the police as, as um, corrupt, or you might have been beaten up by them. A lot of the um, uh, residents of our city aren't just immigrants, they're refugees, right? So they've come from countries where, um, you know, the police and the military were kind of, you know, the same, right? Repressive, corrupt, um, and so uh, it's good for us to know um, what the effects of uh, of all of that are and how we can kind of work with people to make sure that we're overcoming some of those barriers. So I talked a little bit about um, our officers and uh, really uh, knowing that uh, our job is not to, to go to a scene and uh, write a ticket or to go to a scene and just arrest somebody. More often than not, our, op our job is to go out and to serve the public. Uh, by taking and arresting somebody, that doesn't need to be arrested because they suffer from some sort of a mental illness uh, does not help that person. In fact, uh, I think many times it's going to make the situation worse. And so um, our commitment, again, is, is to being uh, helpful in the community. Actually, uh, helpful is one of our four core values that we're supposed to be out there assisting people where we can and helping and making sure that we're using best practices to make sure that everyone in our community uh, is, is well served. Uh, this is Senator Al Franken um, that uh, came, and uh, there's actually some bills being authored right now in Minnesota that may require uh, that every uh, peace officer in the state has crisis intervention training. Uh, this was some information that we were giving him a couple of years ago about the importance of crisis intervention training and what we were, what we were doing in Columbia Heights. Um, it looks like the bill, if it passes, and I think it probably will, uh, again, for officers on how to de-escalate some of these situations and better work with people in crisis. It looks like they're going to go with a two-day requirement. Uh, again, we'll, uh, because of our beliefs and practices, we're well beyond that. But I think it's a great start, particularly for some of the folks that work out state who might not have had the opportunity to have this kind of training in the past. So. Um, I talked a little bit about wellness and mental health, and I, I thought it might be interesting for you all to know that um, this is something that you know we've been working on for some time with our staff as well. Officers uh, obviously go to a, a lot of traumatic calls, right? Um, whether it's a car accident, whether it's a uh, you know a, a bad uh, assault, uh, whether it's uh, some sort of a sexual abuse call, we want to make sure that our officers are whole as well because our staff uh, and other first responders as well can be subject uh, to some of the traumatic experiences, whether they're involved in some sort of a bad call or not. Um, so uh, internally, uh, we're not just saying that, that focusing on mental health is a great thing for other people, 
we're pretty busy working amongst ourselves as well to make sure that our officers have you know, a good outlet for uh, being able to talk about some of these things and deal with some of these issues. And so we focus based on uh, best practices and again, that um, 21st century policing report on the three aspects of um, what it means for police officers to be healthy as well. Um, so we encourage a lot of things for our officers. They work 12 hour shifts so they can work out on their breaks. Um, we wanna make sure that they're involved in a, a good number of uh, volunteer activities. So um, we do a lot of uh, things like uh, shop with a cop where our officers can take families over the holidays and take them shopping. Our uh, program's a little different. Our officers raise all of the money themselves. In some cases, like Target will sponsor it, but we work with some of our local faith community and others. And uh, I think last year we took 14 families, so we don't take the kids, we take the parents, and we take them, uh, and they can buy those things. I think they get five or $600 each. But I think it's important that our staff has a lot of those positive experiences as well, right? When you're going out in the community, and all you're dealing with is people uh, that you know have had, you know, nobody calls the police because they're having a birthday party, right? They're calling the police because their car's been broken into or there's something bad has happened. And I think that those uh, experiences as well with our youth again are really impactful, where our officers uh, by policy have to spend a minimum of 20 hours per year working with our community and meeting them in positive spaces at places like coffee with a cop or in mentoring through the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. Uh, our officers uh, get nutrition and healthy lifestyle uh, information. Um, they do, uh, they're required to stretch every day before they go out on uh, assignment. Uh, we talk about things like suicide prevention. We um, have a person that comes in and teaches mindfulness and meditation uh, at least uh, once a month and now we've taped some videos so that um, they have the opportunity to, to practice mindfulness now as well. Um, the pitch to them was a lot of the sports teams are doing it now, right? They want their players before they hit the field to be able to focus, to be able to let go of a lot of the issues that they've had up to that point because when our police officer goes to your home, we want you to see them at their best. And if they've had some sort of an experience at work and it's been you know, uh, kind of a heated or emotional or adrenaline filled experience, we want to give them the tools to be able to go back to the police department and just take it down a couple notches so that when they go to that next call again, they can be the best police officer that you should be able to expect. Um, so I guess what does it mean? Uh, you've got a, uh, one of the things we're seeing is, you know, we used to arrest about 250 kids a year, 2007, 8, 9. I could go back and you'd probably see 260, 270. We're down to arresting about 90 kids a year right now. That's because, thank you. That's because of a, a whole slew of things, but mostly it's because our officers have really learned about problem solving better. Just because writing a ticket and moving on to the next thing is the easy thing to do doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. And we've got about half as many kids that are involved in our criminal justice system. Uh, that's great for the half that you know, we were able to work with and really make sure that they got the help and support that they needed. Um, same with adults. So we've gone from 11 to 1,200 down to 524 last year. Again, it's our goal to take every person that beats up, robs uh, a person, they're going to go to jail, right? There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. But there's a whole bunch of people that can be better served by us coming alongside of them, working uh, with our community partners and strategic partners, partners to make sure, again, that you know they have what they need and we can make sure that that behavior uh, isn't repeated. Um, I got a great story from one of my Somali officers uh, the other day that um, said that uh, he had a couple of Somali kids that were all joyriding in their mother's automobile. Um, I don't know if anyone in this audience has ever done that when, before they had a driver's license, but I know that I did. <laughs> so he sentenced them to uh, two weeks of assisting at our city's open gym. You know, he, called his, he called their mom, she came and picked up the car, he gave them and, and the mom the option and said, you know, we, have, we do a five weekly open gyms, the police department does for kids in our community. We want to give them positive uh, after school experiences. And so, you know, our cops are really in tune with, okay, how can I work with, with these people in this situation to achieve the best possible outcome? So we're proud of that. Um, 
You know, some people think that's being a little soft in crime. Well, and they say it isn't crime down everywhere. Well, you can see the numbers. Um, crime is down uh, over the nine years, about 23% uh, uh, in Minnesota, 36% in Anoka County, which is fabulous, and 54% in Columbia Heights. I think that's what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's what happens when you have a history of, of coming alongside of people, helping them, and working with all of your community partners to, to have best outcomes. One last slide I'll show you. So the, the red line here is um, community policing hours, or those, those hours where we're, we're having a positive impact by working primarily with kids. Um, you can see that we got about 6,000 hours that our entire police department has. Um, and then the blue line is, is reported crime. So when people tell you that um, working with community or um, you know, trying to help people, that there's not a correlation, um, you can tell them to check our website because we've been studied by the University of St. Thomas, we've been studied by the University of Minnesota, we've done our own internal uh, uh, surveying, and um, I think we've seen some really good things about what happens, uh, and you know, not just with people who suffer from mental illness, but overall uh, when you're working with community to find better outcomes. That's what I've got. <coughs> I hope this was helpful. I, I did want to mention that um, what what Scott talked about tonight was um, some secondary trauma which occurs when you're dealing with a really, really tough situation. And, and Rob has established a system within the Lee Carlson Center for staff to deal with secondary trauma. It's a critical issue for all of us that deal with really stressful situations in our jobs. I, I would just point out that no one ever called the director of special education for a birthday party either. I mean, it was always because <laughs> things were going south in kind of a hurry. So, um, so it becomes a different kind of problem-solving role, and um, that that need to address staff and help them through those hard times, so that they can turn around and be their best uh, for the next situation in the day. Can, um, is really important, and I, if you think about if you think about a therapist and the things that they hear during the day, and then in 15 minutes or, or 10 minutes you have another client coming in. So it's just it, second addressing secondary trauma is really really important, and also <clears throat> I just urge you to not be complacent about these about legislation right now. I urge you to get a hold of your, um, your state representative and your senator with regard to this um, health bill that is trying to be um, pushed through because <clears throat> there's a lot on the line for kids and families and old people. And I'm an old person. So, so I, I think that um, the quality of care, access to care, and um, the school-length mental health program uh, could just die. Because because we don't have um, we don't have that parity of mental health coverage, and so it is essential essential that you um, get your computer out or your or your iPhone whatever you use to um, to uh, get a hold of your state representative and your senator about those health bills. Okay. All right, Rob. I think this one's for you. What behavioral health services are available for college students and where can they access them? Especially concerned about two students as the colleges don't offer adequate help according to the students I talk to. Two-year colleges? Yeah, that, uh, okay, this microphone's on, okay. Um, yeah, and I've heard that too. And it, it is a challenge, uh, it is an issue. Um, actually, that's part of uh, the school link mental health bill, and uh, it's you know who knows what's going to come out in the end when the bill um, you know gets uh, made into law. But uh, they are looking to expand the use of school link mental health services in in other settings uh, beyond the traditional school setting, um, into charter schools, I believe, into community colleges is there as well. Um, so that would be super innovative around that issue and that challenge. I mean, if these are min schools and the state has a stake in the school, just like the public school setting, um, 
you know, why not be flexible and allow uh, us to set up an outpatient clinic um, anywhere in the state where where those schools are? Um, and and we know that it's a challenge. I've heard that. Um, I've heard the waiting lists for services, and and that's so you can be seen on campus. Of course, uh, it's not very convenient for a college student to leave campus to go to an appointment. Um, you know, similar to a child uh, K-12. Um, so the same types of uh, challenges could be met with the same types of innovation, I think. Okay. Um, do you see mental health problems uh, connected to traffic trafficking? I'm assuming that's sex trafficking, and I think either one of you could answer. Maybe you, Scott. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about human trafficking, um, yeah, I mean, um, whether you're talking about the trauma uh, of the people that are involved in human trafficking, trafficking, or if you want to talk about things like the people that get into trafficking, uh, obviously sometimes they're uh, people that have suffered abuse and um, have uh, any number of experiences that have led them uh, to, to be away from, from home, uh, assuming that home was a good and stable place. Uh, yes, I, I think that uh, the people that we come across in trafficking uh, most often are people um, that don't have that great support network and who have experienced trauma uh, in one form or another. So there's, there's a definite link there. We do see those customers as well. And, and you know, we'll see folks who have experienced trauma uh, a while back in life at an earlier date, and then they're still dealing with the effects of that, the impact of that. They may or may not have gotten services uh, after the event had occurred. Um, or they may be new to, new to the community, uh, maybe from another country, uh, who doesn't have uh, the view of, of mental health support in the same way that we do here in Western culture. So um, we do deal with those issues. Uh, they come right into the, the therapy clinic, and, and our, our, our clinicians are working with those issues uh, each week. Do you accept other than uninsured or low in for low income clients? Other than uninsured, um, I think I can answer that. So, okay. if you if you come in to our clinic and you uh, are not on a health plan and you are low income, in other words, you're not insured, um, we can give you some forms to fill out that can allow you to be added to Anoka County's sliding fee scale. We also have a private pay option, and at times we have, um, we have um, funds available that we can underwrite the cost of service. Our SchoolLink mental health program um, has the benefit of having those resources from the state grant that when folks are not eligible for insurance uh, or they're underinsured or they have a high deductible plan, they can apply f to us for support for that uh, for that service, so they can receive the services. Um, there's really no one who walks away from from our clinic uh, without getting the services they need ultimately. So we'll find a way and uh, you know, watch out in the community for us. We're running fundraising events all the time. Come and join us. That's why we do it. That chili cook-off was really fun. Um, the the not the Lee Carlson Center is a non a not for profit program. So agencies that are for profit will not provide services if you cannot pay. And that can run into problems to the, for the not for profit agency because when that bucket tips heavily, you still need to be able to pay your staff. So that, that becomes an issue. Um, do you have to be referred from the courts to be part of the domestic abuse program? No, you don't. You can self-refer. I just know this. Um, you, you can self-refer, um, or you could have a, a health uh, provider refer you. And so you, you don't need to be court-ordered. You can refer a friend, too. Program. You can refer a friend. So. Um, then there's a friend whose grandson is autistic. She lives with me. Her daughter's son has to carry two insurances to cover all their child's therapy. He has intense home therapy since he was two. Why is the, is the question, why is this so costly? Why are not all the services covered under a single plan? Is that what the question is? Well, um, it's hard to know that because it's hard to know what services are, are uh, available. But intensive 
home services are costly services, and um, the child should should be appraised for um, Medicaid um, Medicaid eligibility, um, and where where so much of the parents and all of the parents' income isn't necessarily considered. They they do less and less of that though, but um, but that is still something to look into. Again, this is going back to my director of special ed days. So, um, <clears throat> do you make available to family strategies suggestions for getting the right mental health care for their child? Yeah, we do a lot of family engagement. So, right from the time when you call our receptionist and get scheduled to see a clinician for the first time, the first thing we're doing is, is an assessment. And so, you'll have lots of time to spend with the clinician, uh, just kind of talking about your needs. And making sure that we refer you ultimately to the services that that would meet your needs and if they are not services that we have available you'll be referred to someone in the community close to you uh, that can meet your needs but we have a lot of innovative treatment planning that we do around uh, needs in a family so you can kind of anticipate the direction and course of your treatment and uh, you know some points in the crossroad where you uh, might go this way or that way uh, and you know what services we can provide to you versus what we would want to refer you to and also there's always consultation so so you had a session and maybe that session didn't go well so the therapist catches another therapist in the hallway or actually calls them into another just to, to get ideas those kinds of things happen all the time as they do with school teachers you know you just like I'm up against a wall here. I need I need some more ideas, and that kind of stuff happens all the time with therapists. Um, do parents have to give permission for their child to be treated by a school therapist? Uh, yes, exactly. Good good question. So referrals uh, in a school setting are coming from the parent directly, from school staff who have reached out to parents to say there is a service available in our school, and we think your child might qualify or benefit from it. Uh, we would like to put you in touch if you're interested and they can reach out to you. So we get a verbal authorization from the parent for us to even reach out then to offer services to a family. And then they still get another choice to decide if it's for them or not. They can come in for a consultation. They can come in for a few services. Uh, it's, it's all optional. Opt out at any time. This one's for you, Scott. What do you think about the lifting gun checks for people with severe mental illness? The what do you think about the, the allowing individuals with severe mental illness access to guns? Um, I think it's a, well, I, every case is different, obviously. Uh, but, you know, when you say mental illness, there's really kind of a range of different things that um, that could mean. Certainly, if you've got a person that's a danger to themselves or others, um, I think it's probably a bad idea. Uh, you guys didn't get any of that? It's too bad. It was really a great response on my part. <laughs> I said uh, one of the things about mental illness is that, you know, that, that, that's a catch-all uh, term for such a broad range of issues. And so, you know, um, certainly if you've got a person that's a danger to themselves or others, uh, then I think that that's probably a bad idea. But, you know, again, um, there's a lot of people that um, you know, uh, may have mental illness that might be fine being able to do any range of things, uh, trap shooting or something like that, you know, if that's something that they enjoy with family. And so, um, uh, generally speaking, I think that uh, anyone who uh, you feel would be a harm to themselves or others would not be a good person to be owning a gun. How frequently do you see traumatized kids mislabeled attention deficit H hyperactivity disorder rather than PTSD, which may be a more accurate diagnosis? Well, we're always working really hard to be at, at uh, the front end, front end of best practice in understanding this issue. I mean, this is an issue that's been around for oh, a long time, but really more uh, publicity around that issue for the last three years, two or three years. Um, yeah, PTSD um, is, is, is something that is really I think we're looking to as this is the challenge, this is the issue right now. Um, you know, ADHD, I think that probably has come out of maybe not having appropriate mental health services. Um, and I think 
that's the important part about making sure that we offer uh, psychotherapy outpatient mental health services in as many places as possible. You can get access to a, the services of a mental health professional. Um, and the fact that we can have consultation with many other care providers in our program unit to make sure that when you get a label called a diagnosis, that it's accurate, that it's appropriate. Uh, we always, uh, we take referrals um, of individuals who have seen other providers. We always do an assessment ourselves whether or not one has been done prior to make sure that uh, we're not moving forward with an inaccurate picture of, you know, how you present today uh, at this time and make sure that, you know, we're moving services forward appropriately and it might be uh, that PTSD piece. My experience with PTSD in, in children is sometimes that parents are very embarrassed about a trauma that they may know about and fail to report that trauma. And so then you get, you, ha you are dealing with less than all of the information that's available. I always have the belief that when you ask somebody to help you, it's helpful to tell them everything. Otherwise, their help is less than helpful. So, um, so those things happen sometimes they happen because of reporting is inaccurate you have to go based on the history that you know and that you're told you can't you can't uh, you can suspect but even if you dig you still have to have verification of the of that up to, to make a to make that determination so here's one on comorbidity addiction and mental illness a lot of times go hand in hand what concerns do you have with regard to clients and does this impact it on the federal or state level in a different way? And maybe is there some somewhere both of you might? Yeah, I think we can both answer that. And that's a, 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 a big question, but um, I'm going to attempt to just tell you a little bit about my thoughts about that. So, yes, uh, there are issues where chemical and mental health concerns are intertwined, and it's really hard to track uh, where one begins, uh, where one ends. Um, and you know what is what exactly and so we do need to watch out for that as mental health providers make sure that we have appropriate care provided uh, we don't do chemical health treatment but we partner with many agencies that do um, and they do it very well they don't do the mental health component we do the mental health component very well there are some providers that can do both of those pieces but they are few and far between and it's really critical to make sure that the right services are matched with the, the right needs of the individual. And so if, chem if there are chemical issues, um, it, you might be st struggling to get to the mental health issues and vice versa. So it's important to have that full comprehensive assessment and be looking for uh, the need to refer on to another specialty provider. Are there issues for? Yeah, you know, I don't know uh, that I've got much to add to that. You know, they're, they're almost always intertwined. And so you might have um, regular uh, experimentation by uh, let's say a teenager with marijuana or maybe alcohol but it seems like when you see the um, progression where um, kids or young adults or even uh, people uh, midlife get into things like um, methamphetamine heroin and other things um, you know they, they follow a progression and um, when you really check into those to those cases more often than not you'll see that there's some underlying mental uh, health issues there um, whether those were uh, trauma uh, or, um, you know, I don't know if the term would be maybe more organic or just um, issues that they'd had for some time. Uh, you know, most people, uh, young people, don't get up in the morning and, and uh, you know, present addiction issues without there being a history of, you know, some sort of a struggle before that. How can we best reach out to city, other, to our city's police forces? to see if similar pro proactive programs can be or are being implemented to what, from what you've done in Columbia Heights? I think it's a great question. Um, <laughs> well, the easy answer would be um, to just walk up to the front counter of the police department and say, I have an interest in what you're doing uh, around um, you know, making sure that your officers are adequately trained for mental health. That actually has a lot more of an effect than people might realize. Um, you know, particularly with smaller uh, police departments, I think that they want to be responsive to the to the wants of their community. Um, I think another way would be to to ask at a city council meeting. Um, a lot of police departments, like mine, have um, all of their policies online, 
So if you're curious and you don't want to make that phone call or want to do something to check on that, you can just do some online research to see where any particular agency is on that. Um, you know, I don't know uh, what community that came from, but uh, if anyone in the Columbia Heights community wants to meet with me, um, it's as easy as, as setting an appointment. Um, and so I know a lot of the Anoka County Chiefs of Police, obviously, I, I see them in a variety of different functions and meetings. I know that these discussions are ongoing in many uh, police departments here in Anoka County. Uh, some agencies uh, are probably more progressive than others, uh, but if this is something that is a concern for you, uh, or really any concern in policing, um, you know whether it's you know what is what is the um, what is this police department doing to address you know the changing demographics in our community, or what is what is our police department doing to um, to work with um, senior citizens, um, then I, you know, I think the most forthright way to get the answers to that um, is just to do some research, or maybe just get to the point where you where you ask to meet with them and ask those questions. Okay, um, why do psychiatrists seem to only push pills and not consult? I don't know. I guess that's for you, Rob. That's a great question, and that's uh, one thing that we don't like to hear and is not going to happen at our, at our shop. So we run psychiatry um, pretty, pretty innovatively. Um, if you receive psychiatry services, whether you're a child, adolescent, uh, or adult uh, in our program, you also are seeing a therapist. And that's something that our psychiatrists believe in. That's an organizational philosophy. And our therapists coordinate their care with the psychiatrist and vice versa. You're actually getting two providers. If you come to see us for psychiatry, you're getting two providers. Um, you're going to be receiving therapy uh, concurrently with medication management. And, um, and our psychiatrists are also trying to move people off the medication as quickly as possible, too. So you're regularly, after assessment, while you're in therapy, you're seeing your psychiatry for medication, psychiatrist for medication management. Additionally, our psychiatrists facilitate uh, consultation for our clinic every month. So we are able to have an re ongoing relationship with psychiatrists. They know our practice as clinicians. Um, they really understand um, kind of that holistic care and treatment and the integrative way in which we work. Um, so that's the way we do psychiatry. And if you want psychiatry differently, um, you probably have to go to a different agency for psychiatric care. And, and I would say, as a uh, as a mom who had experienced a therapist who was like dead set against medication, and then I found that we switched to a different therapy center and and got medication, and the change in my child was so remarkable. And I was like dancing on the head of a pin and go back to see the psychiatrist and report. And he goes, "Yeah, we can do better." And I'm like, going, "Oh man, how does how do you get better than this?" So, um, so medication does have a place, and um, and it is it is a chemical imbalance in the brain. So it's you know I liken it to I have to wear glasses to see. It's not like a, a the walk of shame that you have to take a pill in order to function. Sometimes it 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 is critical that it's managed though and not just um, prescribed. And I think I really am an advocate of prescribed by a psychiatrist because um, they know what those, those medications do better than a general practitioner. So um, the last question, unless anybody has any that you're just hanging on to out there, is for Rob. Will you be presenting at the 217 MSA, MSSA conference? What's your topic? And if not, do you have any recommendations for, uh, for that. I won't um, be presenting at M MSSA. I have before, but not this year. Um, <laughs> I just presented at an NASW conference. Um, the MSSA conference is a, is a great place to go. A lot of uh, folks will come in and talking about uh, trauma. So, I mean, trauma continues to be a focus in our field of mental health, and as it is probably in law enforcement as well, um, and in schools. I suggest any any topic you can get more versed in around trauma, and that's that piece around, you know, what happened to to me, not what's wrong with me. I see another card being written on even as we speak. Are there any more questions? No. Okay. If you did not get the handouts tonight, 
would you please give me a card with your email address and then we'll get them out to you. Um, I prefer email, I hate paper, but some people are into bibliotherapy. So, um, so I would, um, I, if, you have, if you have needs around issues of mental health that, that need to be addressed, the, the National Institute, the National Alliance on Mental Illness has a large office down in St. Paul, I think it is, off 280, and they offer resources galore. And, I mean, beyond just this kind of thing, just in my discussion with Sue, I had had two recent discussions with friends, with kids with mental health issues and criminal stuff, she was able to offer all kinds of ideas. So I encourage you, if you have needs in your family, including the person that has the grandchild or the child with autism that's living in the home, where you might need some more supports to go there. Um, they can link you up with some attorneys to help um, advocate for services. So thank you very much.